Okay, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> We're studying the Gospel of Luke here at Santa Cruz Community Church. And we are ready for the 15th chapter, but we have a little bit of the 14th chapter left. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing for us to look at this morning. The 15th chapter of Luke, of course, is a very favorite chapter. It's kind of kind of the heart of the Gospel of Luke. And it's interesting that, uh, that you know, when you look at the, the flow of the chapters, Luke, very early in his Gospel, sets Jesus on his way to the cross and then most of his material is, is after that. Is Luke has just many, many teachings and, and uh, parables, especially, that nobody else has. Uh, so uh, it's, Luke is a very interesting gospel for us to study. So in the 15th chapter, we have those either you can consider it as three parables or that are on the same subject or you consider it as kind of a building parable a single parable that has three parts but anyway uh, before we get to that we have this last part of of luke 14 large crowds were traveling with jesus and turning to them he said if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, those are hard things. I, I have a book called The Hard Sayings of Jesus. This would be one of them. And every commentator that I read says, well, of course, he didn't really mean hate. He just meant that the contrast between your loyalty to him and your loyalty to anything else must be very extreme. I think part of the, the way of understanding this is to see that large crowds were traveling with Jesus as he's moving toward Jerusalem. And there's, there's a great misunderstanding that he has to direct here. They're, they're following him because they think that, that his miracles and, and so forth and his popularity, that here is the Messiah. And when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to take over and set up his kingdom and chase the Romans out and, and we're going to be his people. And Jesus realizes that they have a very wrong idea what's going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem. And he's trying to say to them, you know, uh, if you're going to be my disciples, you have to walk in the way I'm walking. And I'm walking to a death on the cross. I'm not walking to a crowning as, as, as the emperor of the world. So if anyone comes to me, now this still comes to us because remember earlier he said, you think I came to bring peace, but I, bring, I come to bring a sword. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Mm -hmm. Jesus knew very well that the things that he was bringing were divisive, that, that, uh, uh, that people who were dedicated to him were going to be on the outs with the people that previously they'd been insiders with. So he's kind of warning them that uh, you, you're following me, but you're following me with the wrong understanding. And you're gonna find out later that uh, if you're really my disciple, your, even the, your relatives are going to be after you. You're going to be hard on you, and you're going to have to choose. So father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters. But then he adds this, even his own life. You know, to see this is, this is not, he's not talking about family relationships. He's talking about deep dedication. And that deep dedication means even your very life has got to be uh, given to him. Now, he follows this paragraph then with a couple of, of uh, you could call them parables, but they're more like illustrations. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Now, I'm reading, but people are saying, why would somebody want to build a tower? Well, the idea was that if you had property, you had a vineyard, you had the things that you were, that you built this tower and you had a servant up in the tower watching for thieves. Uh, so the tower was an important part of your of your world. So somebody wants to build a tower, and it's got to be high enough to do some good. 
but he doesn't really realize, he doesn't sit down and establish what it's going to cost to build this tower. So he starts building it with a really good foundation and a really, and, and then he gets a little bit built and he runs out of money. So it's interesting that Jesus appeals to the, uh, the, the ridicule. He, he lays the foundation, is not able to finish it. Everyone who sees it will ridicule him. He's saying, don't you realize how foolish this makes you if you, if you set off to do something and you haven't really counted the cost? Uh, the fellow begins, they will say, the fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Then he switches immediately to another illustration, and both of these are illustrations that are saying nobody would, with any sense would do this. Suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. So this ties these two illustrations back to that first paragraph saying, you know, I'm telling you what it's going to be like and you need to count the cost, you need to decide, are you really in? And if you're not, then this is the time to drop out. So, um, now this, this pair, of this illustration of the king, of course, if you're following the news, you're saying, oh my gosh, this is a very one-sided war we're talking about with the Ukrainians and the Russians. So um, there's every effort being made to try to not have that war, and yet uh, uh, we'll see how it comes out. But Jesus' illustration is that the king who knows he can't win the war doesn't start the war. Now, then his last little paragraph is very interesting and kind of challenging to those who are literally minded. Salt is good, but it ta if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Um, this essential parable-like little thing is also in Matthew, but here it's kind of a, of a, a summation of what he's saying. But the first thing that people say is, wait a minute, salt is a, a mineral. If, if it's salt, it's salty. If it's not salty, it's, you know. So my, my uh, people say to me, yes, but they got their salt by taking the water from the Dead Sea and, and having it dried up so the salt was, was not pure salt. It was kind of mixed. I don't know whether that's what he's saying or whether he's just saying, okay, if, if the salt really is not salty, then it's of no use. Mm -hmm. uh, so then, of course, my commentators say, so what was the use of salt anyway? Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth in Matthew. Well, they use salt for preserving things, and he says, see, the way of Jesus, the gospel, is, is a way of preserving. They use salt for flavoring. Uh, so the... But Jesus says if the salt doesn't preserve and it doesn't flavor, what do you do with it? Well, if it has some salt in it, you, you can't really dispose of it in ways where the salt that's in it would be harmful. So he says uh, it's not good for the soil. It's not good for, for the manure pile, which would be what they were fertilizing their failed fields and plants with. It's just thrown out. So what does this have to do with what he said? He's saying, if, if you think you're my disciple and you haven't counted the cost and it comes down to how you respond, how do you react when, when the, this all falls on you, if you're not really my disciple, you're not really the salt, if the saltiness is gone when the, when the persecution comes, you're no good to anything. Uh, you're good only to be thrown out. And then this little thing that every now and occurs when Jesus is saying something he wants them to pay attention to. 
He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, are you listening to what I'm saying? Are you taking it in? Are you, or is it real to you? Now, that all is directed at this large crowd who are traveling with him. And, and it's, it's this mixed crowd. So this is kind of a message to the world. If, if you think that becoming a Christian, being a part of Jesus' uh, ministry is, is a wonderful thing. Have you counted the cost of it? Do you know what it really is all about? Then uh, this, the, who he's talking to shifts very dramatically. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him uh, in the crowd, and maybe the crowd thinned when he said this. Maybe people said, oh, I think maybe he's, I don't really want to be part of this, and they, they left. But the, the tax collectors and the sinners have always stuck with Jesus because he has a message for them. Now, <clears throat> the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are always there critiquing Jesus. So they, here he is again with his sinners around him. He, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They muttered. They didn't directly confront Jesus because every time they did, he had the, the last word. <laughs> so they just muttered to each other. See, see, he's, we've always said he's a guy who eats with sinners. And of course, this was their, this was their idea of religion that God is the ultimate purifist up there and he, he sort of has his back turned to us but he, he watches what we're doing and, and he says, aha, I got you. You're, you're a sinner. Out. You know, and they said, we, we are the ones who keep all of his laws and then some. We almost make up new laws so that we can be better. And so he looks down and he says, oh, those Pharisees, they're my people. Those publicans and sinners they're not so Jesus one of Jesus purposes in, in his being here in his teaching is to show us who God really is I was interested that one of the authors I was reading said uh, that a Jewish scholar uh, was evaluating Jesus teachings and he said well the one really thing that Jesus really introduced that was that changed everything was the idea that God cares about people that God cares about people who are sinners so what we love about this 15th chapter of Luke is that Jesus is answering their murmuring and he's saying no no you don't really know who God is you don't really understand God so if you listen to me, I'll, I'll try to show you who God really is. And the, the whole chapter leads up to the, the large story at the end that we call the story of the prodigal son. Many of the people I was reading say that's a misnomer. It's not about the prodigal son. It's about the loving father. And I would have to agree with that. But anyway, so these other two stories are, are sort of setting the scene and saying, can you imagine how, who God is and how he thinks and how he feels. So <clears throat> he starts, and let me pause for just a minute to say, you know, Jesus has a, a very difficult assignment in his lifetime because he's born a Jew, he lives with Jews, he's raised a Jew, all his disciples are Jews, everybody he talks to is Jews, with, with a few exceptions where he talks to Gentiles, but when he sends his 12 out, he says, don't go to the Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So all of his life, he is, he is the, the ideal person under the Jewish system. He is fulfilling the Jewish system. But all the while, he is preparing for something quite different. Now, it's interesting. Mark writes his gospel to help the people, that the Gentiles, to know who Jesus really is. Matthew writes his gospel to verify that Jesus really is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. and, and Matthew is, is very aware in several of his passages that the Gentiles are part of this. He's an apostle. He's out working among the Gentiles when he writes this gospel. But Luke 
and of course John is one of the apostles. He's raised Jewish, but now has worked for years, and many years among the <laughs> Gentiles. But Luke comes from the Gentiles. He's a student. He's a, he's a thoughtful, intelligent person. He, he knows that the Gentiles need to understand Judaism and understand who Jesus, where Jesus comes from. And so he's very true to his description of Judaism. And yet, Luke has been there with Paul. He's been to Philippi and seen the, the gospel take root there. He, he wasn't actually there. He knows about Thessalonica and, and Corinth. And, and uh, he knows that what the gospel is all about. So in, in researching the life of Jesus and in telling us the things that Jesus taught, always Luke has this double meaning that, that it's, it's addressed to the Jewish audience, but it also is preparing the way. Uh, so when, at one point Jesus says the law and the prophets are until John the Baptist. After that, the kingdom of God is preached. Luke is aware that even all of this that Jesus is teaching is preparing for the gospel. Now we who live in the gospel understand these parables immediately because they are about the gospel. They're about who God really is and how God really treats people. Uh, but stop and think, you also need to understand Judaism. If you don't understand uh, uh, the, the Old Testament, look at how much you'd lose. Look at how deep the faith is rooted. And when Paul describes this, he, he sees that all of this that God did before Jesus came were the roots of this tree that now becomes his kingdom. So uh, Jesus he knows this muttering. He knows that what their Pharisees are saying. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety and nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there will be rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents more than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now, a couple of things we ought to talk about with that before we move on. In the first place, you know, its roots are back there with the 23rd Psalm and with, the, with David and his shepherding. Uh, and even though at the time of Jesus, apparently the shepherds were not so kindly thought of, but uh, the Old Testament is full of this reference to the leaders of being the shepherds of the people. And, and uh, Jesus knows that he, he's sounding a note that they can understand that uh, now when he says that he leaves the 90 and nine in the open country, he doesn't mean that he leaves them for the wolves and stuff. Uh, they explained to me that probably uh, flocks of sheep like this were, were the, from the village and, and they would have, there would be several shepherds. So the chief shepherd would go off after the one sheep, but the other shepherds are looking after the, the flock and the flock is never in danger. Now also we would want to comment on his saying, the, the 90 and 9 who don't need any repentance. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I think he's, this is for the purpose of the illustration. It's not for the purpose of, of a doctrine that there are people who don't need to repent because they're that good. Uh, I think he, he's just saying, if you really were that good, Pharisees, do you not see that God would have more joy over one of these sinners coming back to him than he does over you who always were there. Now remember that idea when you get to the last parable, the last part of the parable. Mm -hmm. But the, the whole point that he introduces here is the idea that God is, is a God who is personally involved. And like the shepherd, 
uh, and I, I think there's a lesson for us here in the idea that, you know, you don't have to deal with thousands of people in order to be serving God. If you're dealing with one person that you are helping to know God in a better way, you are, are serving as God wants you to serve. So <clears throat> he, uh, he's, he's wants them to see that God is like this shepherd. Actually, Jesus calls himself in the Gospel of John, the good shepherd. So this is, this is God, this is deity saying, one of mine is, lo is lost. And the idea that even these sinners still are, are belong to God, he created them. Uh, they, are, they are always in his heart. So when one of the sheep is gone away, the shepherd is not going to say, well, I still have 99. Who cares about that one? He's going to say, wait a minute. I've lost a sheep and I, I can't rest until I find it. So you've sung that old hymn, the 90 and 9, you know, that, it, that says the shepherd goes off and he, he suffers through the wilderness until he finds the sheep and then he puts him on his shoulders. Now this is not necessarily a lamb. So the shepherd is strong and he can carry that sheep on his shoulders and he does. There's a lot of application we can make there to uh, the idea that God provides for carrying us when, when we're needing to be brought back to him. Now it isn't, you know, he says, uh, uh, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents you can't really apply that sinner repenting to that sheep. The sheep, uh, you, you have to be a little more Calvinistic about it at that <laughs> point and say that, that the shepherd found the sheep and rescued him. The sheep did not find, find its way back. So the repenting is just to be understood uh, in a different way. But the, the rejoicing, the idea that, that uh, God finds more pleasure, God rejoices over the one that comes back more than over the 99 that were he already had. This is the, inner, the idea that's introduced that this Jewish scholar said Jesus really made a difference in the way people thought about their, their religion. Now then he switches immediately, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have lost my, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, what do you do with this switch from a shepherd to a woman who's lost a coin? And it's the same percentage. No, it isn't. It's a, it's a much sharper percentage. She's lost a tenth of her, of her coins, and the shepherd had only lost 1% of his sheep. And the coin presumably is more valuable than the sheep. We have a little trouble with understanding money in the New Testament because, you know, we have different... The Jewish money, when you go back further, the shekel and the talent, these are weight, you know, the, the value is in the, in the material. You, you have a, a, some silver or some gold, and you have a, the weight of it is what makes, gives it its value. Then you move on to Alexander the Great, and, and uh, Alexander begins to, to put a different kind of organization about things. And so then you have the, the, the drachma. Now drachma is a Greek coin. It's still, it's a silver coin. So it still depends for its value on the silver that's in it. But, but it's, the drachma is a certain coin that has a certain value. And the way we usually understand this value is that, uh, that a, one drachma was what you paid a laborer for a day's wages. Remember in the, the man who hires the people to work in the vineyard and the, the whole thing about that he paid the last ones the same as he paid the first ones. But what they agreed to work for for the day was one drachma. Now, 
Then the Romans come along and they put in Roman money, but the Roman money now is stabilized by the fact that the, that the, the government says this is what this, this is worth. So when Jesus, when they are asking Jesus about paying taxes, you don't pay the Roman government in Greek money. You don't pay the Roman government in Jewish money. You pay the Roman government in Roman money. So you have the denarius. Now a denarius and a drachma are approximately the same value. But the coin itself is probably, the drachma is a much more valuable coin because of its content than the, the the Roman coin, Jesus says, so whose coin is this? It has a picture of Caesar on it, and on the back it has a Roman inscription. So it's Caesar's coin. So he says, give Caesar what belongs to him, and give God what belongs to him. And we've been working on how to understand all of that ever since. But you see the difference in the coin. When they pay their temple tax, the coin that Peter gets out of the fish's mouth is a shekel, because this is Jewish money. So it gets confusing. And then we have the woman who puts the two copper coins in. And those copper coins are almost worthless. They, they're called like a hay penny, a half penny. A penny is the smallest of coins, but these are only a half a penny. So she's, you know, she has almost nothing. And Jesus says, yet her two little coins are worth more than all the gold that the rich people are putting in the temple. So anyway, what do we do about the fact that he switches from a, a shepherd to a woman? Well, you know, I would warn you that sometimes in parables, we, we sort of start with our conclusion and then we, we read it into the parable. Um, I, I think that I would see in this that uh, Jesus is not concerned about uh, whether it's men or women. Sinners are sinners and saints are saints. It doesn't matter whether they're men or women. So he finds it's very comfortable in switching his illustration from a man shepherd to a woman housekeeper because the, the same illustration is there. Now I was reading J. Vernon McGee and, and I love a lot of things about J. Vernon McGee but I think he tends to at times work his doctrine into his interpretation. So he says, well, the woman must represent the Holy Spirit. I'm saying, Jay Vernon, you mean God has to be male and Jesus has to be male, but the Holy Spirit can be female? <laughs> I don't see that there's any reason to say that, that Jesus intended the woman to represent the Holy Spirit. I think we can see the shepherd represents Jesus himself. I think the woman still represents God in whatever sense. And now, she has these 10 silver coins. Two ways to deal with that. The simple way is that they didn't bank their money, they kept their money, and, and so you, you had a kind of a, a, a budget you, you operated on, and then you had some, what I would call like mad money that you kept. And if she had 10 silver coins, she had a very significant uh, backup for, but if, if times were tough, she'd have to spend those coins and use them. So she loses one of them. Well, she's lost 10% of her reserve money. That's a very significant thing. So she searches for it. The other idea is that this is kind of ceremonial, that, that, a, uh, uh, that back in their history, the, the, that when a woman got married, she was sort of given these 10 coins as a, as a kind of a, well, it wasn't a necklace. She wore it on her head. So the coins, you often see a picture of a woman with a mm -hmm. coin at her forehead. And if one of the coins is missing, then she doesn't have her, her keepsake. So some compare it to like a wedding ring, losing the stone out of your engagement ring or something. I don't know. Uh, Jesus does not say what the significance is here. The simpler thing would be to say it's just money that she's concerned about. But... We're also told that their households often just had dirt floors mm -hmm. and then they put straw over the floor. So can you imagine losing a coin in that and going through that? And then they had very little windows, so she lights a lamp. And she's going through everything in her house. Do you see that the point of this is how much 
The shepherd cared about the sheep, how much the woman cares about the coin, how significant it is. And this is a picture of, of God's concern for sinners. So she lights a lamp, sweeps the house, and, and searches carefully until she finds it. Now, the idea that she goes to her neighbors and says, I found my coin that was lost. Maybe she'd gone to the neighbors and said, oh my gosh, what a tragedy, I've lost one of my coins. And the neighbors are saying, oh, you poor woman. And now she goes and says, I found my coin. And they're happy with her and they rejoice with her. And she, and so Jesus says, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. Now, he, he could put the angels in both of these, but he only mentions them in the second one. That, that this rejoicing in heaven involves the angels. It's a party in heaven. Everybody's involved and happy. When, when one sinner repents, again, the coin didn't do any repenting. The coin was just found by the woman. So if you want to deal with theology there, you see that God really finds us. We don't find him. We don't, somebody says, well, he was searching for God and he finally found him. Well, God wasn't lost. He was lost. <laughs> so then he just continues and this is not the kingdom of heaven is light kind of a parable. He just continues with his story. So you can see how this is kind of one thing. It flows from one to the other. And the background of these two illustrations is there. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now you have to see in this this story that Jesus is really flying in the face of the Jewish ideas uh, that that these these Pharisees and dealers in the law will not be seeing the wonder of the father's love they will be seeing this father as stupid he never should have given that boy the money he never should have welcomed him back uh, you know this is the wrong thing to do this is not the way to be a, a man so uh, Jesus is in his story is trying to win them over to see that God is, doesn't think the way they think. So the man has two sons. The younger one says, give me my share of the estate. Now, by Jewish and legal tradition, the older son gets a double portion. If you divide the estate in thirds, the older son gets two thirds and the younger son gets one. But presumably this is a significant estate and that is a significant amount of monies and it must have been a significant strain on the, on the household to take the money out of the household and, and give it to the boy so it was no longer usable by the father and the older son and their, their uh, economics. So not long after that the younger son got together all he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living <laughs> now you do see that this this boy is and this is he's saying this to jewish people uh, this boy starts out as an insider and chooses to leave his father and leave his home because the lights of the city over there are drawing him and he's saying that's where they really have fun and that's where I want to be and, and there's no reason I should be working on this farm all the time. I want to go where, where there's... Now, Jesus at the beginning of the story does not say what he did. Later, the older brother will say, well, he, he spent it on prostitutes, but the story doesn't say what he spent it on, just wild living. Now, we don't exactly know what wild living would be then, but we probably could figure in what wild living would be now. A boy goes to the city, there's, there's parties, there's nightclubs, there's, you know, all those wonderful things in the city. And he's got money, and he's got, money makes friends, so he's, uh, he's the, the, the new guy, and boy, everybody's wanting to be on his party list, and the money is going and going and he's not paying any attention because he has lots of it. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. Uh, so Jesus is saying this is the way the world works. But he's also saying this is the way God works. 
uh, that, that God puts pressure on this situation. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. The no one gave him anything is this idea that when you have money, you have friends. If you don't have money, those friends don't know you. So um, instead he, he has to try to find a job and, and what worse job for a Jewish boy than to be tending pigs. Pigs were unclean, pigs were Gentile food. And these pods that the pigs ate were something that humans didn't eat, but the pigs would eat. So, and he's saying, gee, I, I'm so hungry I could eat, take the pods that the pigs are eating and eat them. But uh, he, they're not appetizing. They're not really what he wants. And, Oh, I have explanations of what these pods were, but it didn't mean anything to me, so I don't think it'd mean anything to you. They were something that they grew to feed to the pigs. When he came to his senses, now that's an interesting phrase, when he came to his senses, when he saw where he was and how he got there. So here is a, a, a repentance kind of idea. Uh, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father. But going back to his father is a humbling thing. He can't just walk back and say, here I am, Dad, I'm, I'm back, you know, I, I, I want everything. He already spent everything that belonged to him. I will go back to my father and I will say, I have sinned against heaven. Isn't that interesting? I have sinned against heaven. Uh, yeah, I sinned against you, Father, and against the family, but I sinned against heaven. This is not what God wanted me to be and to do. I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. I presume he's sort of rehearsing this thing as he goes along. This is what I will say to my father. And he expects his father to to accept him and, and let him be a hired hand. Uh, he, he thinks maybe his father will be kind enough to do that. Although I'm told that by Jewish tradition, he shouldn't have been accepted back at all. He should have, the, the father should have turned him over to the community to be stoned to death as a, as a, a bad son, a bad person. But while he was still a long way off, now this is where this begins to get emotional. When he was a long way off, his father saw him. The idea is that the father's been watching. The father expects him to come back. He doesn't go after him, not like the sheep and the coin. He doesn't go and, and bring him home, but he waits for him to come and he expects him to come. So the father saw him and filled with compassion. See, they would never see God as having compassion. God was a strict disciplinarian. If you were good like them, God patted you on the back and said, you're a wonderful person. If you weren't, God said, get away from me. I never want to see you again. But God was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. This is sort of a picture of God's caring. I think those Pharisees say, what? God running, throwing his arms around him and kissing him? Whoa, whoa, this isn't the God we know. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, I noticed in my footnote that some of the manuscripts don't have that longer phrase. It looks like the father interrupted him in the middle and didn't want to hear the rest. But some of the manuscripts follow his, from what he did, intended to say. The father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put on him. Now, McGee says he must have given him a bath first because you don't put clean clothes on a dirty body. But it doesn't say anything about that. The robe is the robe of, of, the, of a son, of the member of the household. Uh, so by putting a robe on him, he's, he's accepting him back into the household. 
and put a ring on his finger. Now this isn't just jewelry, just decoration. This is the ring that says you have the authority of the household. You, you are a part of the, the, this family's uh, uh, authority. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. I'm told that slaves never wore shoes. They always worked barefoot. So by having shoes or sandals, uh, he is recognized as not a, a hired man or a slave, but recognized as a part of the household. And I think about some of those songs that come from the old slavery days. All God's children got shoes. <laughs> so, and a robe. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. <clears throat> so, um, he, he was a son, and yet when he was away in the far country with, with his share of the inheritance, he was no longer a son by reason of the fact that he was dead. That's the way they would consider it. Somebody who turned away from the family that way was just dead. It was as if they had died and were buried. Sometimes they would actually have a funeral for them. So uh, now he says he's been resurrected. This is a new life that he has. And, we're, and he was lost. And now he's found. So it's worth celebrating. So they, all the people and the, the servants around in the household, joined in the celebration. They could see the father's joy and they were happy for him and happy for the son meanwhile the older son was in the field now here the parable takes a little different turn and and this you can see is going to pluck the interest of those pharisees who are listening when he came near the house he heard music and dancing so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on your brother has come he replied, your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. They saw the father's joy in this. They were glad to see the younger son back home. They saw it as a, something good to be celebrated. So they just said, yeah, your father's killed the fatted calf. He's glad to have him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. Now, What's the relationship between the father and the older brother? Well, the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. A young goat was far less desirable than a fatted calf. But you never gave me anything. You never celebrated me. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. And the father says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because your, this brother of yours, now notice the, the, old, the older brother calls him, says You're this son of yours, but the father says this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So this is this beautiful story that we love. God is that God who, who wants to, who, who loves the, the person who's gone astray and wants them back. Uh, all he wants is for them to come to themselves and see that they really belong with God and not with the world. And then they, he's welcomed and, and made a full part of the household you see when you get luke is saying when you get to the gospel that paul preaches he says that even the gentiles who never were god's people can now become god's people and be adopted into god's family and be his sons he sees the gospel in this story in a way that the pharisees probably couldn't see so this is a great story. It's one that we love. Um, I wonder, uh, I, I think 
maybe we should talk some about that. Do you, uh, you see things in this story that, uh, that interest you or, or that are different than what you've seen before? Or just has this always been a favorite story? And what do you always, what do you, why is it a favorite story? Again, I really think, you know, that Jesus is telling a story to try to get to their hearts in a way that he couldn't just by explaining to them. He wants them to identify with this father and to see that God is like that. God has, has reason to be rejoicing when someone comes back to him, when someone becomes his by their own willingness to be his. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he's appealing on behalf of the, the sinners that they're saying he shouldn't have anything to do with. But he's also appealing to them. They kind of are the older brother in this. And he's saying, if you really have always served God and always loved God, then you, God has always been your father and everything he has has been yours. You don't need any special attention. But special attention is, is called for when somebody becomes one of God's people who has not been in the past. We had to celebrate and be glad. This picks up the, the lost sheep and the lost coin, the lost boy. We had to celebrate and be glad. He wants them to see that this is the God that, that he's teaching them exists, that who celebrates who rejoices when he, he wins a, a convert back to himself. He was dead and is alive. That matches Paul's Ephesians theology when he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God has brought you to life in Christ. He has given you life you didn't have. The lost and found... Uh, Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. The, the idea of being lost to God, being lost to God's love and purpose, and then being found and being back in God's love and purpose is such a, an overwhelming, happy thing. Even the angels rejoice, and we should rejoice when one comes back to God. Okay, uh, the 16th chapter is, is really a continuation of this same teaching, but it's, it's again one of these parables. And you know, when you look at the parables carefully, you see they're always sort of, of setting something before us that, that is conflicting with how we usually think. So this uh, 16th chapter, we have this guy who's been the manager of the estate who's who's been caught wasting the money an issue that's still with us to this day of, to, are those who have money doing what they should be doing with it <clears throat> but um, so he's going to be fired and um, he says to himself uh, what am I going to do when I'm no longer the, this important person this manager of this a state with all this, these resources that might, so I, I'll just be out there thrown out. Well, I, I, I'm too old to dig ditches for a living. I can't do that. I'm too proud to, to be a beggar. Uh, and I don't think being a beggar would work. So I, I got to figure some other way. So somehow in Jesus' story, what this man does is is considered clever and and with with a good purpose and yet it the parable is entitled in this translation the shrewd manager but often it's entitled the the uh, sinful manager the guy who did so but there's discussion of of whether it really what he did was really that wrong so we'll talk about that next week so you want to go back to the
paragraph in the 14th chapter and talk anything about the uh, uh, Jesus uh, re saying count the costs and, and this very strict and strong warning that he gives about not being salty any longer. The contrast from that paragraph to the 15th chapter really struck me in, in studying them together, that mm -hmm. it's an entirely different audience and it's, it's an entirely different message with a different purpose. And yet these two messages fit together. You, you can't say, well, Jesus is always one who's talking about, about sacrifice and death and, and requirement. Nor can you say he's always one who's talking about grace and love and forgiveness. He's talking about both. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the contrast in who he's talking about and what his purpose is in that particular uh, account is very significant. Mm -hmm. Remember that before this last paragraph, he was talking about uh, the idea that of uh, being invited to this great banquet, they had, the, the idea that heaven, being with God, was going to be a joyful, like a, a wonderful banquet. And then he says, but this man has a banquet and he invites people and they don't want to come. So then he goes out and he gets the, the lame and the blind, and, and, but that didn't fill his house, so he goes out into the farm lands and, and compels people to come and fill his house because they will get the, be the, the guests at the banquet, but these people who thought they were too good to be his guests will never be included. So you see there's kind of a, of a nip at the end of that, that there are those who are included who you wouldn't think would be included and those who are not included who themselves thought that they would absolutely Ultimately, he would beg them to come and have and eat with him. So then following that, then he talks about this cost of discipleship that fits right together. <clears throat> so Luke is, we've got a long ways to go in Luke and a lot of uh, material to cover especially parables. I have at the bottom of this page a, a thing showing me a list of parables and where they're found. And I have like a whole half of the column are all parables found only in Luke. Uh, the Good Samaritan, the Friend in Need, the Rich Fool, the Unfruitful Fig Tree, the, the seats at the wedding, the great banquet, the cost of discipleship, the lost coin, the prodigal son, uh, the shrewd manager, the rich man and Lazarus, the master and his servant, the persistent widow, the Pharisee and the tax collector in prayer. All these are Luke's and he, and he say, kind of saves them up and puts them at this place where they're part of preparation for the crucifixion and resurrection. So he has lots and lots of material, even though he very early on uh, says that Jesus is going to Jerusalem. It isn't until the 19th chapter that he really gets to Jerusalem. So you have all these chapters that are filled with teaching on his way to the cross and on the way to the resurrection. So Luke wants us to be able to see that the cross and the resurrection are the, the conclusion of, of his teaching ministry, and he's always teaching toward them as he's moving toward them. Okay, we've got a few more minutes yet before our hour is up. Anything more you want to ask about or talk about? realize in teaching this class I'm teaching people who've been studying this material for many years it's not all that new and usually the ideas that I'm giving are probably not new at all so you really don't have a lot of discussion or question about it I'm 
they said Nofsinger because he always had some kind of a question that would take me in a different direction. Okay, well, we will close a couple of minutes early and give you a little longer for fellowship before we head to our gathering in the sanctuary. So let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this teaching of Jesus. We thank you for the times when he calls us up short to ask us how committed we really are, how really prepared we are for the, the life of, the, of one who is truly his disciple and not just a follower with, with wrong ideas about what it is to be his follower. And then, Father, we just thank you for this idea of, of Jesus reminding us that you are personally involved and that you are personally rejoicing in those who come to you, come back to you, and, and you are seeking. You're not neutral. You're not opposed to those and saying somehow they must get themselves back. You are seeking the lost and seeking to bring them back to yourself. Help us to be your, your agents in doing that, Father. Give us your blessing as we fellowship together today and as we listen further to your word. In Jesus' name, amen.